Today, we continue into the uh, book, into the Minor Prophets, by looking at the book of Obadiah. Now, the prophet Obadiah communicates God's concern for the relationship between two nations that had a shared history, Edom and Judah. It's a story that goes all the way back to the beginning, to Genesis. The story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Now, if you're familiar with this story, you're going to remember that Jacob was the younger brother and Esau was the older brother. Now, the short version is that Esau sold his position as the eldest to his younger brother, which was both a sign of giving up his traditional blessing and giving up an increase in his inheritance. Now, this action, whether you see it as psychological or spiritual, left Jacob the younger to be this success and Esau the elder to be always fighting for some kind of place in the shadows. You can imagine that his, this would have left both men at odds with one another, yet somehow they reconcile, acknowledging that they are forever connected as blood relatives. The book of Obadiah is written thousands of years later. But the story and history would have been passed from generation to generation. And the connection between the two nations, Edom and Judah, were so strong that when the law and the covenant were written between Israel and God, it was made clear that they were forbidden from detesting or abhorring an Edomite because they were, his, they were brothers. Yet in the book of Obadiah, we see that Edom has treated Judah in this detestable manner by contributing to Judah's devastation. And God sees this lack in care for those who should have seen each other as brothers and as close relatives as sin. He says, because of the violence you did to your close relatives in Israel, you will be filled with shame and destroyed forever. When they were invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem. But you acted like one of Israel's enemies. If you, sh you should not have gloated while they were exiled. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering calamity. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering calamity. You should not have seized their wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads, killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in a terrible time of trouble. Edom's response to the nation of Israel is one that spits in the face of his brother. And God declares vehemently that this is sin. To see your brother and long for their demise is something that goes against the very nature of God. And so we can assume along with the author, Elizabeth Axmeyer, that God takes human relationships seriously between husband and wife, brother and sister, friend, friends and neighbors, classes and races, societies and nations. We are responsible for justice and mercy and love towards those whom God has brought into our life. As God has acted toward us, we are to act towards others. And while this can easily be offered to those who have earned our love, to those who we respect, to those who have gone out of their way for us, and sometimes even for those that we barely know, we can find it extremely challenging to live out the same truth with those who are closest to us. The father who left us, the mother who nags at us, the sister who manipulates, the brother who rebels. The husband who is distant, the wife who is controlling, the child who disrespects. We can find it hard to love one another deeply when they didn't first love us. And so what is our approach to living well in the presence of those who are close to us but have hurt us? How do we respond to those who should have defended us and walked beside us yet have abandoned us or betrayed us? How do we respond with it when that same person finds themselves in the midst of their own catastrophe, in the midst of their own disappointment? 
Now, if our example is scripture and we choose to follow after Jesus, then we come to recognize that we love one another not because of what they do or don't do, not because they meet or don't meet our expectations, but we love because Christ first loved us. And we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to do the same. This is a challenging call that is best illustrated in a story. Several years ago, I I listened to this uh, radio show that many of you probably listen to in the mornings called The Current. And they had this, um, this woman who was being interviewed, and she was a filmmaker, who had created a documentary called Mom and Me. And it was the story of relationship between her and her mother. And it begins with the daughter searching the streets for her drug-addicted prostitute mother, and then bears witness to their decade-long journey together towards her mother finally coming off of the street um, and finding sobriety and hope. And at one point, the interviewer asks Lena, she says, why didn't you give up? And she says something like this, if she had died and I wasn't connected to her and I didn't know, I never would have been able to survive this. This felt like the only possibility and I didn't know if she would have the life she has today, but it was the only thing I could do. You just don't give up on your people. That phrase from this daughter who somehow became a parent to her mother as she fought for her to go to rehab and watched her relapse over and over again until she finally found freedom from that which held her captive reminds me of Christ and us. He doesn't give up on us, regardless of how hopeless our case appears to be how desperate our crawl home seems to be, how frequently we make mistakes. God announces through his death and his resurrection a love that seems to say, you just don't give up on your people, even when it costs you. As we encounter those who have hurt us, those whose words have cut us, those whose actions have betrayed us, our first inclination is rarely to treat them as Christ treats us, But imagine a world where love was truly all you need, where we began our journey with those who have hurt us with the very love that God offers to us, this unconditional, full of forgiveness, it will cost me everything kind of love. I wonder what our world would be like, what repairs to relationships would be received, what our marriages and our relationships with our children would be like what we ourselves so fully released from changing a person to simply loving them where they are, regardless of their change, where would we be? But the reality is that sometimes love is not enough. Not that love is not the right direction. It's like not that love is not the right posture to take. Rather, the love we offer to those around us is not always accepted and it is not always acknowledged The love that we have to offer is not always a thing of value. And while this does not give us the opportunity to move away from love as an action, we need to figure out how we're going to live well and move forward in the midst of those who refuse to love us back. For those who refuse to receive our olive branch, those who refuse to acknowledge our kindness, our presence, our effort to make things right. What do we do when all of our efforts and prayers and actions seem to fall against this unresponsive brick wall? Now, author Jim Palmer outlines his own painful journey with his absent father, who he reflects long before he left the family. He was already gone, never engaging with him in any meaningful way. And Jim acknowledges that this left him feeling ugly, stupid, and worthless. But he comes to this important conclusion along the way, that his father's distance and inability to connect were not so much about him as a son, rather they were solely about his father alone. Outlining his father had this troubled relationship, he'd been involved in war, and that all kinds of dreams had been shattered for him. And then he outlined some keys to moving forward, and one in particular stood out, the phrase, choose life. 
And he goes on to say this, if I'm reading Jesus correctly, the message is that ultimately your peace, freedom, contentment, and well-being is not dependent upon anything or anyone outside your control, including your father. The source of love, peace, freedom, contentment, and well-being is the life of Christ within you. That source is never threatened by life's circumstances, and nothing needs to change in order for you to access abundant life. Healing may not mean your relationship is fixed, restored, resolved, or gets any better. Instead, healing may mean realizing this is not preventing you from being at peace, at peace and free right now. And I couldn't say it much better. We can only control our part of the deal. We can only offer love. We cannot force it to be accepted. We can offer grace. We cannot force it to be acknowledged. We can choose to forgive, but it doesn't mean the person is going to change their behavior. But we can choose life. We can choose not to be defeated by the words of others. We can choose not to be swallowed alive by the contempt of others. We can choose to find our identity and our worth in what Christ says about us and what he has done for us rather than falling into despair because of what humans and what humans were never intended to provide for us. But let's not forget what God through the prophet Obadiah was trying to communicate. He was saying to Edom, when the one who stole your birthright centuries before finds themselves face to face with destruction, when the one who tricked you centuries before finds themselves in danger of failing, when your brother or sister, your mother or father, your husband or wife, those who are closest and dearest to you, but who have failed you, find themselves at the end of themselves. When the one who betrayed you but is still near to you falls down, do not add to their demise. Do not rejoice when they fail. Do not stand back when you could step in. Do not boast about their sorrows. Do not clap when they fail. Do not take from them when they are down. Do not make the suffering of those who made you suffer worse simply because you can. Remember what you shared. Remember the history that you have. Remember the ties that bind. Remember that they are still made in the image of God. And remember you are still called to love. Remember that when you are at your lowest, when you came to recognize your errors, when you came to acknowledge your need, it was not at that moment that God let us go, but rather it's at that moment that God embraces us and does not withhold grace from us for a day or for a moment. Instead, he gathers us up and he pulls us out of the miry clay and calls us his own. It is not our place as children of God who have experienced great love and grace to hold the grudge and to allow bitterness to cloud our perspectives, to allow our hurts to cause us to hurt others. It is not our place to be delighted when they are despondent, to be overjoyed when they are broken, no matter what they have done to us, where they have left us, how bruised and battered we were when they abandoned us or how callously they betrayed us. We are not to glory in their revenge or to rejoice in their demise. Romans 12 sums it up so much better than I can ask the worship team to come forward. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. 
If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them.